Welcome to episode 23 of the Women Inspired Podcast. Welcome to the Women Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, April Seifert. There is nothing more powerful than a woman who is inspired to action, and that's my number one goal, to inspire you, my listeners, to take action in your lives. Each week, I get to interview some of the most inspiring women, and I'm bringing those interviews to you. Let's do it. Brigadier General Sandra L. Best began her career in 1984 when she enlisted in the Minnesota Air National Guard as a personnel specialist and progressed through the enlisted ranks to technical sergeant. She is now the very first woman in the history of the Minnesota National Guard to be promoted to Brigadier General. General Best is the Chief of Staff for the Minnesota Air National Guard. She's responsible for command supervision, oversight, and leadership of the 133rd Airlift Wing and the 148th Fighter Wing to include all items pertaining to manning, operations, readiness, and training and equipping of units in the Minnesota Air National Guard. Well, guys, I am so excited about who we have here today with us. Um, phenomenal woman, really great backstory, really great information to share. So without further ado, I would love to welcome General Best to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much, April. I'm really pleased to be here. So I gave everybody a little bit of a bio, but I always like to get to know people based on their backstory from their own words. So help us get to know you and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I grew up in Northeast Minneapolis and I had two loving parents and I'm the youngest in a close family of five children. My father was a laborer and my mother provided daycare out of our home. Both of my parents worked very hard to support our family, and neither of my parents graduated high school. Wow. But, but later in life, after raising all, my, all of her children, my mom went back to school and completed her GED and an associate's degree. So my mother was very pro-education, and she is one of my greatest inspirations and advocates. She always told me that, <clears throat> excuse me, you can do anything boys can do. And then she'd pause and finish and she'd add only better. I like your mom so much. I, I do too. And she's no longer with us, but she is forever with me in my heart. I love it. And my siblings are also close and also among, among my biggest supporters. And then I need to mention my husband, who I met through the military when I was nearly 21, and we married three years after we met. And we celebrate 29 years of marriage this month. So he's been with me. <laughs> thank you very much. He's been with me nearly as long as I've been in the military. He is my best friend, my strongest advocate, and he routinely reminds me that nobody can do it better when self-doubt occasionally creeps in. And he is unquestionably a driving force in my life, along with our four daughters, two who have also served in the Minnesota Air National Guard, one still serving. And, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my extended guard family and the network of friends that I have that support my service. So my life is very full and richly blessed. I love it. You've mentioned a bit about uh, the military in your background. Um, tell us a bit about what you're up to now because it's very, very exciting. Thank you. I serve, currently I serve as the Chief of Staff for the Minnesota Air National Guard, and I have been serving for 33 years this, um, in February, and um, even after 33 years that I've been with the Minnesota National Guard, I'm still very enthusiastic about my membership. The Guard has and continues to have a huge positive impact on my life, and I welcome every opportunity to share my experience. So as the... Oh, go ahead. No, that's phenomenal. I, that's just... You can hear the passion in your voice. Thank you. 
And I was going to just share that as the chief of staff. So what does that mean for the Minnesota Air National Guard? Um, the Minnesota Air National Guard is comprised of two air bases. We have one here in Minneapolis-St. Paul, the 133rd Airlift Wing, and they fly C-130 transport planes. And then we have another one in Duluth, Minnesota, the 148th Fighter Wing, which flies F-16 fighter jets. Nice. Very, very cool. So tell me a little bit about uh, what your average day looks like. Well... My days and my nights somewhat run together, and I don't think there's an average day. They're all very different. Um, and my job, like many jobs in the Minnesota Air National Guard, aren't nine to five. We work hard during um, brief periods of downtime, and we play hard. And the most important thing for me is... I think just growing up in the Guard, I love it, and I love the airmen and soldiers that I serve with. What initially motivated you to join the military? Well, my sister, Sue, led me to the Minnesota Air National Guard. She served for five years before I ever even came into the service, and then she got out. But she is a pioneer, and when she joined... Um, the Minnesota Air National Guard, it was just 10 years after Congress had authorized the enlistment of women in the National Guard. Yep. And at that time, there were just a sprinkling of females in the Guard. And so it took significant courage to join a male-dominated organization. So I'm proud of her and her service, as well as the other pioneers like her who went ahead of me and helped pave the way to make it easier for women who followed how, so how has your experience in the military, this is probably a very broad question, but how has your experience changed since you first enlisted? And I'm sure there's been changes both in, you know, as more women have enlisted, uh, there's probably changes that have come along with that, as well as changes in your rank and what your responsibility is um, as you have um, moved up within, you know, various positions. And you're right. In 33 years, culturally, things have shifted significantly, but there has never been a day that I haven't enjoyed it. I started out enlisted, so I was enlisted in the Minnesota Air National Guard for seven years and then eventually um, continued my education and um, was selected for commissioning and went through all of those different ranks. And um, ultimately was selected for general officer and um, had no expectation along the way that that would be the end or, you know, that I'd uh, finally achieve that rank. When I first joined as an enlisted member, you know, my goal was just to make it through basic training and maybe my first, my first enlistment. So, um, but culturally, I think certainly the number of women serving has increased. In Minnesota, we have 50% of our population is females. And in the Air National Guard, we have about 23% of our, our population is females, which is still going in the right direction. That's phenomenal. That's real. I mean, that's amazing. Actually, that really surprises me. I wouldn't have guessed, uh, 50%. Just, I don't know why, but I just wouldn't have guessed that. That's exciting to hear. Well, and 50% is, I'm sorry, 50% is how many women, you know, so our population for Minnesota, not in the military. Oh, okay. 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 So 50% of our, um, population in Minnesota is men and 50% is women, roughly. Yeah, gotcha. And so our comparison to the Air National Guard is 23% of our population is female. Nice. That's still a good, uh, a good percent. I mean, we're not down in single digits, so that's... Um, that's, that's right. Really great. It's going in the right direction. And and the Minnesota is doing well, both in the Army and the Air National Guard in our gender representation. And um, the Minnesota National Guard is working hard to make our environment inclusive for all who serve. So you mentioned um, a recent, uh, fairly recent 
pretty big accomplishment. Um, you recently became the very first female brigadier general in uh, the National Guard. So uh, for people who just don't have a background with the military or maybe just aren't as familiar with the details of it, can you talk a bit about what that title means? I mean, what does it, yeah, basically what does that title mean? Sure. Well, the, the, as an officer in the military, there are kind of three categories, I'll say, of officers. And the first one is um, company-grade officers, which are your second lieutenant, um, first lieutenant, and captain. And then you get into field-grade officers, which are your major lieutenant, colonel, and colonel. And then you move into field grade officers. There's four different generals, and that would begin with Brigadier General being the lowest of a, of a flag officer, and then Major General, and Lieutenant General, and then finally General. And the top general in the state of Minnesota is a two-star general, um, Major General Richard Nash, who is the adjutant general in our state. How did it feel that day when, um, you know, you officially achieved that rank? What was that day like? Well, first of all, it is such a great honor to rise to the top leadership position in an organization that I love so much. Oh, absolutely. Where the values and the mission are perfectly aligned with my own and most importantly, representing the men and women that I serve with. But the day itself, it was a bit surreal and never, ever, while moving up through the ranks, did I imagine I would actually be promoted to Brigadier General. Um, so it'll be a day that I remember with great fondness for the rest of my life. And I thank the Minnesota National Guard leadership and Governor Dayton for their trust in my capabilities. Governor Mark Dayton and General Rick Richard Nash that I already mentioned, the adjutant general, and he is also my boss and the top ranking general officer in our state. Those two pinned on my rank. Mm. It was very cool. And my historic promotion and ceremony was held at the Women's Club, which, by the way, is a wonderful venue in Minneapolis and a wonderful group of women. And so how did it feel? To put it simply, it was amazing. Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, it's... Um when you think about where on any big journey, where you start, right. You, you start at the very beginning and you think, okay, maybe I can just make it, you know, like you said, maybe I can just make it through basic training and my first enlistment, <laughs> like maybe I can just get there and that'll be like, okay. And then we'll pause and we'll see where we're at. But it's amazing to just I can imagine to be in the position that you're in and look back and see how far you've come. Um, it, it's, it's almost like, I don't know, do, do you want to talk to that woman who initially started and said, wow, I hope I can just make it through basic training and be like, come on, honey, you're going to get so far. I mean, do you, um, do you look back at her like, oh my gosh, what were you thinking? I, I think, yes, I do. And I guess my, I want to first say that Although that day was amazing, what is most amazing that I have to share with you is that although I was the first, I wasn't the last mm. because shortly after I was promoted, Brigadier General Joanna Clyborne was promoted as the first female Brigadier General in the Minnesota Army National Guard. Nice. So that is to me what made that day even more remarkable is that although I was the first, she was the um, first in the Minnesota Army, Nas Army National Guard, neither of us will be the last. And the reason is because when I go back to that Airman Basic and Airman First Class that I came in as, um, it was because of remarkable leaders who constantly were pulling and my peers who were 
kind of saying you can do this and people pushing from below that help you achieve those um, dreams, whether it's in the military or in the civilian world. I think those are the things that really help you get and do everything you do because we all second guess ourselves. Is this really what I should be doing? And so it's those people above, beside, and below you that um, really help you achieve. You don't do it on your own. There's two pieces there that I want to hit on. One is that it's refreshing and also shocking, but I guess maybe it shouldn't be shocking because fundamentally we're all human, but it's amazing to hear somebody who has achieved the level that you have in such a powerful entity. It's amazing to hear you say you felt self-doubt. So it's refreshing to the rest of us mere mortals who experience that on a day-to-day basis, um, you know, outside of, outside of a organization like that. Um, it's incredible. But then two, I love your focus on the people who are around you because it's absolutely true. None of us ever achieves anything great completely in isolation. Um, There's this quote that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And if you think about it that way, it's so important to surround yourself with those people who are going to help you push for your goals and help keep you focused and aligned and motivated and help pump you up when you need it. Um, it's just so neat that you call those people out and that you had that support system around you. Well, first I have to comment on your mere mortal, mere mortal statement because Dr. April Cipher, you are nothing short of um, pretty inspiring yourself. That's so and I do... <laughs> I do agree with you um, that it is those kind of appreciation for others and helping because we don't. It is a team effort for people to succeed. And um, I love that quote that you mentioned, the average of five people you spend the most time with, which makes it so important on how you choose your friends, on how you choose a partner for life. And all those people who are mentoring and coaching that those and your friends. Absolutely. You know, you've mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, the the presence of women within various branches of the military. Uh, And, you know, there have been there's been in a lot of sectors of uh, our culture, there's been an increased attention on um, the positive outcomes you get by. Uh, increasing the diversity of whatever whatever entity or organization you know you're you're talking about having a diverse group of people working together and bringing different perspectives always results in a better outcome. Um, how important is that for you? Well, it's it's extremely important for me, and I think all women in general. So I'll start with. Um, the Governor Dayton and the Minnesota National Guard are committed to creating an inclusive culture that empowers women and minorities to reach their full potential in an environment where both men and women can thrive. And so I think inclusivity is vital to the health of our force and our nation. And I feel like it is my job and that of my peers and subordinates to bring people of all ethnicities, races, religions, gender to our service. Mm -hmm. And um, it will prove to make the Minnesota National Guard and the nation stronger. So diversity and inclusion remains a priority that we continue to enjoy progress in in the Minnesota National Guard. The reason I mention Governor Dayton when I talk about the Minnesota National Guard, and this is one of those things your um, uh, your audience might be interested in knowing, is that the Minnesota National Guard is different than some of the other re- reserve components in that we take two oaths. The first oath is to the President of the United States, and the second oath is to the Governor of the State of Minnesota. So we can respond to federal contingencies. We can also um, respond to state contingencies. And so Governor Dayton is our Commander-in-Chief, so we work for him. And so I mention that because 
we partner with his priorities to ensure that we're enforcing those also. And diversity is a very, and, and inclusion is a very important priority for Governor Dayton. And one of the things that the governor is doing is he has created a council that's called the Young Women's Initiative of Minnesota Council that ha- that is led by his chief of staff, Jamie Tincher. And then Um, It is also supported by the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, President and CEO Lee Roper Butker. And um, those two women are leading this charge on behalf of Governor Dayton with a lot of young women in um, representing all of Minnesota's diverse diverse sectors and hearing from them the needs that we need to address to have access to equal opportunity in order to create and lead safe, prosperous lives for these young women in Minnesota. So that is an exciting um, venture. And then in addition to that, the Minnesota National Guard, this year we will hold our fourth annual Women's Leadership Forum, where we are also focused on helping women achieve their dreams, and we are doing it through professional development and leadership, and started four years ago with about 100 women, and it was a semi-formal kind of an event. And then the second year, it was held at Metropolitan State University, and it grew to about um, 300 women that were in attendance. And that year, our keynote speaker was a four-star general, General Wolfenbarger. She was one of she was the um, one of the first women to attain four stars. And then last year, we held it at Best Buy Corporation corporate headquarters and out by the airport and we had a variety of speakers but one of them was the first female to graduate from army ranger school and that was pretty powerful and this year we'll be holding it in september and we have a whole bunch we have a large committee that works on speakers and ideas and we're anticipating over 500 women from the Minnesota Army and Air National Guard officers and enlisted and we're, one focus is going to be on emotional intelligence but it is open to men and women because we don't get ahead without men supporting women Absolutely. and the same leadership principles apply for both genders, um, but it is targeted to help with the advancement of women. It's really cool to hear you talk about these specific initiatives and these people that uh, have all come together to work on them, because it's one thing for, you know, a company or an organization to um, say that they're committed to diversity and inclusion and say that they are, you know, working on these, uh, these topics, but it's a very different thing to start to push forward initiatives and start to create opportunities for, um, learning to happen and for growth to happen. And it sounds like, you know, you all are taking that pledge and that focus on diversity and inclusion. You're taking it really seriously and really doing something with it. It is. We have six priorities for the Minnesota National Guard, and you know our number one priority, of of course, is the readiness of our men and women that are serving to be able to um, uh, meet the missions of the Minnesota National Guard. Um, but one of the six priorities is to diversify our force, and General Nash has been the leader of that priority of all of our priorities, but he has been um, deliberate about ensuring that it permeates our organization from the top all the way down to our newest airmen. So we have um, diversity ambassadors. We have a director of diversity and inclusion that we took out of Hyde. So it is definitely gained momentum and um, we are really working hard to establish that culture of inclusiveness. And while while we're talking about women, women represent a all 
diverse sectors of the population. So women, it's easy to talk about that movement of women and how they're um, gaining momentum and moving ahead, but it really is also helping all diverse classes when women move ahead because they represent every diverse classification we can think of. I love that. That is, I love that. That's such important work. And uh, there's, you know, a million articles and and peer-reviewed research to back up why these initiatives are so important. So that's really exciting to see. Um, I have to ask you who, when you think about the folks around you, who inspires you? I think that helping people achieve their dreams really gets me excited. So I would say people inspire me. And that's inside our organization. I've already mentioned I have four daughters. So certainly women succeeding in society is important to me because um, I want to see all my daughters succeed. And I also want to see all the men and women that I work with succeed. So people are really um, what inspire me. I think the foundation of the Minnesota National Guard's effectiveness has always been its leaders. Mm -hmm. And people look to leaders for guidance, advice, mentorship, and inspiration. So um, it's said when you become a leader, success is all about growing others. And so I really enjoy helping people find their purpose, capitalize on their strengths, and achieve their dreams. I love just like I just, did. Totally. I love what you just said, that when you become a leader, your success means you're helping other people achieve. It's not, uh, it's not universal that people recognize that when they hit, uh, you know, a, a leadership level in, you know, a company or other organization. So you can tell that it's something that you're very committed to. And I guarantee that the people who are mentored underneath you and see you see you as an example, I guarantee they're really benefiting from that. Thank you. So it's kind of a strange question to ask uh, to somebody in uh, your position right now, but hey, what's your next goal? So you've gotten here. What else? What's next? Wow. Well, I think that it is likely that I will be transitioning out of the military in a few years. So next for me will be the exciting possibility of utilizing my experience from the military and applying it to private sector. So I'm, I'm very excited for what that future might hold for me. But before that time, my goal is really to do exactly what we've already been talking about, grow leaders so that there's a leadership bench to draw from and ensure the continued success success of our Minnesota National Guard. So awesome. And yes, that's kind of, that's what I'm doing. I'm growing leaders and looking at every opportunity that we can do to have professional development and leadership and that the leaders um, have the tools that they need to ensure the readiness of our airmen and that they're growing for the future. So Thinking back now, go back all the way to that woman who just wanted to make it through uh, basic training up through the experiences that you've had more recently. When you sum it all up and put it all together, what advice do you have for other women? My advice is to be self-sufficient and work hard, to prioritize your formal education, make it a priority. Be the first one to work and the last one to leave. Maintain balance. Live your life with integrity and dignity. Seek out mentors. Love your life, love yourself, and love those all around you. And to be bold, be brave, be your best, and believe you can do it and you can. That's all really good advice. I, like my heart just kind of swelled when I heard all of that. It's really, uh, really great advice and really good, really uh, good bits to keep in mind as we, you know, move through difficult times or start to doubt ourselves for sure. Um, Thank you. Can I share one other personal story? Yes, I would love it. One mentor for me that really made a difference in my more senior um, years, the last 
five to seven years, um, he shared with me something that I didn't know about women. And this, I think, is important for anybody in your audience that is interested in knowing because it really made a difference in my life. And what he shared is that women have a tendency to want to master 100% of a job before they're ready to move ahead. Mm as opposed to men who, as soon as they get a job and they've mastered, um, you know, a significant portion or a portion of it, they're ready to move on at a faster pace. What's next? And so that realization when um, this mentor, it was a male mentor, but when he shared with me, and he had done a lot of research on that too, that women, so when I would start saying, when will I be ready for my next job, I would be thinking three to five years, where my male counterpart, same skills qualification, they might say they're ready in one to three years. Mm. And that difference, I think, is really important for women to remember because um, ever since I've known that, I started being much more deliberate in that I love the motto, um, she believed she could, so she did. Because we all have that self-doubt that creeps in. And so you need to surround your, yourself with people who will help you eliminate that self-doubt. And I really do believe we got to believe in ourselves first in order to continue to advance and do what we want to do. That's so great. You know, it's funny. I um, That's something I've talked about in a few episodes here. I, I mostly kind of point to the podcast as an example of this, but... Uh, you really don't have to have everything figured out to get started. You really just have to know how to do the first couple of steps and then you'll kind of figure the rest of it out along the way. But the, the self doubt part of it is key. I mean, you have to, you're, you're absolutely correct. You have to have enough faith in yourself that you'll be able to figure it out. And something that I've done. So, you know, I launched my own, um, you know, data science consulting business in the last couple of years. And in the beginning, there were a lot of those things. There were a lot of these stumbling blocks and a lot of barriers that I had to figure out. And finally, and encountering each one, I would absolutely panic. Like every time a new thing came up, I would panic and think, this is it. This is the end. I'm not going to be able to figure it out. But as I started, you know, figuring out how to do each of them, I started writing them down like, hey, in January, I didn't know how to do this thing. And here's how I fixed it. Next month, I ran into this problem. And here's where I am now. And now I've run into this issue. And here's where I am now, because it didn't occur naturally in my mind to remember, no, the last dozen times you've encountered a barrier, you've been able to figure it out, you'll be fine. I needed tangible, a tangible reminder that nope, you should have some faith, you're going to hit hiccups and road blocks and you're going to figure out how to get around them. It's okay. So true. And I agree a hundred percent. The hardest part of any new job or when you start a new venture is that first six months where you continue to try and second guess yourself. And then all of a sudden I constantly remind individuals as they move into new opportunities is if you can get through that all of a sudden you start becoming a more proficient. And I think the key in that vulnerable period of time is to realize we're not in it alone, like what we talked about earlier, that you rely on all these other people. Mm -hmm. And you are a much better collaborator and team-oriented when you're in that vulnerable period. And so I think it's healthy. We grow the most when we're stretched the most. I totally agree. I couldn't have said it better. So I have one last question for you today. We, it's a question I ask everybody, and we are compiling a Spotify power playlist of songs to keep people motivated throughout the week. And it's turning into a very interesting, cool collection of songs. So I have to ask for your contribution to our playlist. So your favorite motivational song. Uh, can I pick more than one. You can actually. And it's, this is a hard question for people. People typically end up having to pick a couple. That's great because I would like to at least pick two, but even two is really hard. I like country music. So, um, some of mine is oriented that way, but 
I would say I'm going to first start out because um, I'm a a general in the military. I'm going to start out with a patriotic song, which would be Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. Awesome. It's also a cool one because it has from the lakes of Minnesota in it. And of course, I like that one because I am proud to be an American. And then my second one would be Whitney Houston with Mariah Carey, When You Believe. I love that one. And I think um, my favorite quote from the song is that there can be miracles when you believe. And it ties... It ties to that other quote that I mentioned. She believed she could, and so she did. It has been so phenomenal to talk with you. Oh, my gosh. You have been so open about your experience, and you have, you know, uh, you're you're a lens into an area of our, I guess, of our country that not all of us get to see. So... I really appreciate that you have been willing to share your story and, you know, be so open with us about the experience that you've had. Well, thank you very much. I think it's wonderful what you are doing to help women achieve their goals through these podcasts and hearing about other women, because I know I'm personally motivated by the inspiring women such as yourself that are doing just really incredible things here in Minnesota, but really all across the nation and the world. And so I think this podcast um, women inspired is just fantastic. So thank you for your service and what you're doing to help women achieve their goals. Thank you so much. And we, on behalf of everybody who is listening to this, we thank you for your service and for everyone who's worked around you and underneath you for their service as well. Thank you very much. It is such a cool thing when you get to meet somebody who's achieved an incredible level of success, yet somehow they are still human and humble. It's just awesome. I mean, you can totally tell that General Best is authentically committed to helping other people succeed. It's just a cool thing. So on that note, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to do the same thing. Because the thing is, I guarantee there's an area of your life where, you know, you've struggled, you've worked really hard to, to achieve success. Maybe it's an area where you have a lot of expertise that other people might not have, whatever the case may be. How can you reach down to help pull someone else up? How can you help somebody who might be trying to walk down that same path? How can you help them get down that path a little bit more easily? Now, sometimes when I think about situations like that, it's almost like people divide into two groups. There's people who, um, you know, on one hand, they'll go through something really difficult and it's almost like they have this mindset of someone who has to initiate everyone else who's coming after them. You know, people who think, man, I went through this difficult time in getting to where I am and dang it, you're going to go through a hard time too. So there's those people and those people just aren't that helpful. Then there's people who are true leaders, people who just in their heart, they want to like carve an easier path for people who are coming after them. They're committed to supporting their success. They want to see other people around them succeed. That, that's freaking magical. So the question I have for you is how can you be a leader for someone else? It could make all the difference in the world for that person. Now, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who've listened to my episodes so far, reviewed them on iTunes, and shared them with other people. I am such a believer in having mentors and role models, and this podcast is a way for me to provide some fierce, inspiring role models for all of you. This still remains to be one of the coolest projects I've ever done, and I'm just so happy that you're on this journey with me. So until next time, have an inspiring week. (laughs) 